I was saying, therefore, that the invitation is to be king, servant, servant king, king who becomes king by being servant and king who becomes king only by being servant. And I'll tell you why I am stressing the word only. When you look at the text and you look at the entire gospel, you will realize that other ways are suggested. For example, when Simon Peter answers, you are the Christ, Simon Peter suggests another way. After the second passion and resurrection prediction in 931, the disciples seem to be suggesting another way. In the third passion and resurrection prediction, in chapter 10, verses 32 to 34, and later, what follows later, in 10, 35 to 40, James and John and the other disciples seem to be suggesting another way. So there are other ways which have been suggested. But God's invitation says there is one way. You want to accept it? Okay. You don't want to accept it? It's fine. So the acceptance depends on you, but this is the way. So Jesus, however, accepts this invitation. And I am calling, these are my terms, I am calling this acceptance, on the one hand, as a passive acceptance, and I'll tell you why I use the term, and also an active acceptance. So Jesus accepts the invitation passively and actively. This is the passive acceptance of the invitation. The spirit immediately drove, ekbalo, drove Jesus into the wilderness. The Greek term used is eremos. Eremos might be translated as desert, might be translated as wilderness, might be translated as lonely place. So it might not necessarily mean a wilderness like the des a deserted place. It might mean simply away by himself, simply in a quiet. And Mark does not mention 40 nights. He simply mentions 40 days. And he does not mention about fasting because he possibly took that for granted. What is interesting is this, that in all the synoptic gospels, the temptation is immediately after the baptism. And the reason why Matthew and Luke have Matthew 11, and Luke 13 verses in their temptation scene, and Mark only two, because Mark does not explicate the three temptations. Matthew and Luke explicate the three temptations, stones into bread, jumping from the pinnacle of the temple, and the kingdom of the world will be given to Jesus in Matthew. Stone into bread. Jesus will be given the kingdoms of the world. And he's taken to the pinnacle of the temple and told to throw himself down because God will save him. Luke tells us, for those who might misunderstand, saying that Jesus was tempted only three times. No, Luke will tell us in Luke 4.13. And the devil left him until an opportune time. So in other words, the devil would keep coming when the time was opportune, when Jesus was weak. And for me, in Mark, Mark 14, 32 to 42, there also there is a temptation. As a matter of fact, in Mark in chapter 15, 
verses 25 following when he's hanging on the cross the three temptations are there that is the passers by the chief priests and the scribes and the ones who were crucified with him you can see there the three temptations so luke makes it very very specific that it was not as if jesus was tempted to feed them those three temptations are metaphors for rejecting the invitation why do you want to be selfless be selfish why do you want to live a life of austerity why do you want to live a life of simplicity why do you want to live a life which you care for others care for yourself accumulate gather have this power let people respect you because they see you and are frightened of you show your authority to them show them how much you have show them your accumulation show them your wealth why do you want to give your life in service there's so much the world is offering there is so much that you can take why do you want to give so you might say these are metaphors mark does not have them and they are metaphors for accepting or rejecting the invitation mark uses this strong verb ek balo which is used in mark to show jesus driving out demons so it is the spirit and the same spirit which comes down on jesus so assuming it is the holy spirit driving jesus and so the reason why the spirit is leading to show jesus is capable i will face the challenge head on i will not run away i will not hide from it i will face the challenge head on yes there will be temptation yes there will be challenges but i'm going to face them because mark mentions only 40 days and for, not 40 nights and because even though there might be other references to which it might appeal exodus 34:28 moses deuteronomy 9999 and 918 once again moses and elijah in 1 kings 198 there in all the cases it is mentioned 40 days and 40 nights because of the overcoming of david of goliath 1 Samuel 17 16 where the mention is 40 days it seems that Mark possibly has 40 days to show how David overcame Goliath Jesus overcomes Satan however David the reference to David is made also later in chapter 12 verses 35 to 37 so it is likely that Jesus is also for Mark the new david the new king so while in all the three of exodus deuteronomy and kings the references are to 40 days and 40 nights it is in 1 samuel 17 16 alone that it is 40 days adam as representing the first human person sinned and because of adam's sin there was this split there was this break there was this triple alienation and the triple alienation was humans between humans the person you gave me gave me and so i ate humans blaming human beings the second is the alienation between humans and nature the serpent gave me and so i ate blaming human nature and the third is between humans and god the triple alienation genesis 3 14 to 15. and because there is this triple alienation human beings are always at loggerheads with nature you will strike its head and it will strike your heel now that jesus is with nature he is in the wilderness is an indication that jesus also 
is the new Adam. So we notice here, if Mark in Matthew's genealogy goes through great pains to show that Jesus is of the lineage of Abraham and David, and Luke's genealogy goes through great pains to show that Jesus is of the lineage of the first human being, Adam, here in these verses, both David and Adam seem to have been brought together by Mark. By showing the 40 days and the overcoming, like David overcame Goliath, Jesus overcomes Satan. Goliath is the name given for a huge person. And like Adam went away from God or was pushed away by God, Jesus now comes close to God. This verb peirazo can be used in both senses. So God wants to test your metal. As a matter of fact, now in the COVID-19 situation, we could interpret this to say we are being tested. We are being tried. It is a challenging situation. And there are a variety of responses. That it is a trial, there is no doubt. Is it a trial from God? Is it a trial from Satan? That can be debated. But that we are being put to the test, we are being tried, nobody can deny. And the response we give can be of a variety of responses. And we have an example in Jesus of how to respond. So it could be God putting us to the test to show us what are we made of within. Is your faith a fair weather faith? When things are going well, God loves me, God cares for me, God is this and God is that. And now, I can't see God's hand. I can't feel God's presence. Are you really a person, a man or a woman of deep faith, which believes even though it does not see, which believes even before it sees? Another way to understand Peirazzo is that Satan tried to draw Jesus away. What is the sense of believing in God? Look at your state. Look at the state of the world. People are dying. There seems to be no end in sight. Given to despondency, given to depression, what sense does it make to continue? Makes no sense at all. So that is what the messages. And these two kingdoms will keep coming. Even now, those two kingdoms are before us. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of Satan seems to say, it's of no use. What is the point in persevering? What is the point in persisting? It makes no sense at all. People are committing suicide. Give up. Give up. Give in. And we can see, and we are blessed that we can see, that Jesus also has gone through these challenges. <clears throat> if I did not mention this earlier, I did. I'm doing it now. And if I did mention it earlier, I think it bears repeating Sometimes we might say, Jesus was God. Jesus was son of God. And so therefore, he could do it easily. If you say that, 
there is a danger of giving in to what is known as Dorchitism. D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. Dorchitism, where we believe that Jesus is not fully human. He is merely an avatar. The avatar is not fully human. It seems to us to be human. But Jesus is different. Jesus is different. Jesus was human in every single sense of the world. And the evangelists, Matthew and Luke, through the birth narrative and Mark through this temptation scene, want to show that humanity, if he was God, he could not be tempted. God cannot be tempted. What is God going to be tempted against and for? Everything belongs to God. So Mark shows that humanity. Of course, Mark shows it in many, many other ways. But Matthew and Luke also, one of their intentions in the infancy narrative is to show that humanity. See, he is born of a woman like every one of us is. And so therefore, Mark is telling us that just because human doesn't, just because God's son doesn't mean he could not be tempted because he is human. The response of Jesus is to overcome, not to go Satan's way, not to go the way that Satan is tempting him to. And that is why the angels now come. And Mark's Telling us these angelos, the messengers, God's servers, were serving Jesus. Diakonun, a diaconate, a deacon, is one who serves. So that is diakonun. And the angels now act as deacons. And the mention of the angels is an indication that Satan is pushed away. That Jesus will not go on Satan's side. The possible reason why Mark does not mention that Jesus fasted was because it is taken for granted that being in the wilderness, he would have fasted. Because Matthew and Luke want to specify the stones into bread, they speak about the fast of Jesus. And so Jesus is the Adam, the second Adam, the new Adam, the obedient Adam, who will not dip into the temptation. And I call this the passive acceptance. And the reason why I call it the passive acceptance is because very clearly we are told here that Jesus overcame temptation. And so, Jesus overcomes temptation and the angels wait on him. When we come to the active overcoming of temptation, we will see what is meant and how it is distinguished from passive. If you remember the structure which I proposed, the first 13 verses are where Jesus is in the desert. The next is the Galilee section and we will deal just now with the Galilee section. Because the Galilee section is a large section, made up of a number of chapters, I am going to divide this Galilee section into three chapters. And each of these three chapters is structured in a similar way. The first chapter begins in chapter 1 verse 14 and ends in chapter 3 verse 6. 
this chapter, I call these three chapters one chapter for our purposes. This chapter is divided into four parts. And the first part is a summary or a proclamation. The second part in this chapter is connected with the disciples. And here it is connected with the call of the first four disciples, Simon and Andrew, James and John. The next part in this chapter, the third of the four parts, is where the kingdom comes, but the kingdom comes with authority. And the fourth part in this chapter is where there is a conflict. And in the first chapter, the conflict is the Pharisees and Herodians who go out and plot to destroy Jesus. The second chapter I call and term as a chapter of struggle because in these verses, the kingdom will come. It does come, but with difficulty. And like in our first chapter, there is a summary here. The summary is about the teaching ministry of Jesus and the response to that teaching ministry. There is also, as in the first chapter, the disciples. And here, unlike earlier on where it was the call, here it is the choice of the disciples and their naming. So we are given the list of the disciples in Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 19. The kingdom comes, yes, but it comes with difficulty. Another synonym for difficulty is struggle. And finally, there is conflict. Notice the conflict here. His own town's people, the people from his hometown are the ones who create the conflict. In the third chapter, and you notice, which begins in 6, 6b, and ends in 821. If you look above at the word Galilee, you will notice the first beginning of the Galilee section, 114, is what begins our first chapter, which I have titled Authority. And the last verse in the Galilee section, 821, ends our Galilee section, which I have titled the third chapter, Jew and Gentile, also 821. So 114 to 821, the section of Galilee is divided into three chapters. And in the third chapter, there is in one verse, and Jesus went about among the villages teaching. A summary given of the activities of Jesus. Someone may say, if Mark says, and Jesus went about among the villages teaching, why have you put teaching and healing? Because we will see right from the beginning of the gospel, there is no dichotomy between the words of Jesus and his action. Jesus says what he does, and he does what he says. Like in the first two chapters, where there was something connected with the disciples, here there is the sending of the disciples. The disciples are sent on mission. Unlike most rabbis at the time of Jesus, where the disciple would sit at the feet of the rabbi and learn for a lifetime and continue learning. In the case of the disciples of Jesus, they learned and were sent. So if we look at the first disciples in chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, they are called. 
if we look at the second time where the choice is made, they are with the Lord. And if we look at the third time, they are sent out. So a different kind of relationship with the disciple. The Gospel of Matthew is a gospel which is very, very particular within the gospel. It becomes universal at the end of the gospel. And when we come to texts in Mark, which are in Matthew, we shall see that particularism which Matthew has within his gospel. Mark, however, is an evangelist who right from the beginning has this kingdom, not only for a specific group, Mark's Jesus proclaims the kingdom for everyone already within the gospel. As I said, the Matthean Jesus is exclusive, is particular, is restricted within the gospel, but not the Mark in Jesus whose kingdom is available for all. And once again, like in the earlier two chapters, there is the conflict. And this conflict is with the disciples. If you look at the word conflict in all the three chapters, what we notice is this, that if in the first chapter, the conflict is with what we might call outsiders, the second chapter, the conflict comes closer home. It is the town's people, the people of his hometown. And in the third chapter, it comes even closer the conflict is created by the disciples. So this is how we will deal with the Galilee section made up of three chapters. They have been termed authority, struggle, Jew and Gentile, because even as we go through these chapters, we will see that this is how they have been narrated by Mark.